Today we will discuss um, the epidemiological side uh, of, of um, COVID-19 and various sources of health data uh, that are available to you to uh, draw your own conclusions and sort of look at the uh, primary data. Um, but before, you know, in the ongoing saga of remdesivir and other treatments, there were two things in the news. One uh, was this continued um, uh, uh, criticism of remdesivir in the light of um, the solidarity trial that we discussed last time, uh, including this uh, editorial published um, two days ago in Science uh, with the title, The Very, Very Bad Look of Remdesivir, the First FDA-Approved COVID-19 Drug. It, it is a good read. It's short and accessible. So if you're interested, um, I, I recommend uh, that, that you look up the reference. There is a pithy quote here. Uh, attributed to uh, Martin Landre of the University of Oxford, who's co-leading the world's largest study of various COVID-19 treatment, uh, that said, quote, um, remdesivir definitely doesn't work in the sickest patients where the biggest gains would be, but might help people at earlier stages of the disease. Uh, further complicating the matter, most people infected with SARS-CoV-2 recover without any intervention, uh, which is, I think, a point uh, that is not uh, emphasized enough, so that a traditional standard care uh, standard of care treatment has actually become more and more successful, and we'll discuss it in one of the remaining lectures, sort of the dropping um, death rate, all other things being equal. The argument that the earlier you use is, the better is great until you realize what the implications of that are. You won't save many lives, and you'll have to treat a lot of patients. It's very inconvenient. It'll cost you a fortune. Uh, so this is actually not um, inconsistent with either of the studies that we discussed, because uh, if you remember, uh, even the NIH study that led to uh, the compassionate use uh, approval in May did not demonstrate a significant effect on uh, improved survival. All they were able to show, and that was a primary outcome, is how quickly people recovered. And if you remember, if you stratify patients based on the severity uh, of their symptoms at admission, if you were in the most severe categories, giving your remdesivir did absolutely nothing. Uh, so there's there's also, um, there are also some really sketchy uh, um, uh, reports on uh, Regeneron, uh, unfortunately, and by sketchy, I mean it's not entirely clear what the implications are. Uh, there, there, there's some excitement about the fact that it reduces some fairly nebulous measures, but I, don't, I haven't seen anything um, to show that it reduces uh, uh, mortality, which is what you really need, because at the moment, what is really missing is uh, a uh, treatment that allows uh, individuals that are already in poor shape when they are admitted to the hospital to have better outcomes. And there's at the moment nothing that is specific to uh, SARS-CoV-2. All right, so um, uh, even though it may seem like this pandemic will never end, uh, it will all of the pandemics, uh, including the ones that were much worse in terms of uh, the fraction of individuals killed and the fatality rates have ended. And I would just like to remind you that infectious diseases have been around since the dawn of time. Um, the thing that I like to quote is this treatise uh, due to a famous um, uh, Arabic scholar uh, named Razi's. His full name is Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Zakaria al-Razi, uh, who uh, wrote, um, it's actually an amusing, not an amusing, but it's sort of a very historically interesting document uh, that was translated uh, to English, among other multiple languages, in the 19th century. And it talks about um, the differential diagnosis of smallpox and measles. Um, and the reason it's instructive to read is even in the complete, people didn't, they understood that there were different diseases. Uh, importantly, they understood, for example, there's a quote here, uh, that the fatal and the mild species of smallpox and measles. So the smallpox and measles are the number of acute and hot diseases, and therefore they may have many things in common with them with respect to the symptoms which indicate the disease to be mild or fatal. Now, the chief prognostic signs in those who recover are freedom of respiration, sadness of mind, appetite of food, lightness of motion, a good state of the pulse, and patient's confident opinion respecting the event of his own illness, a convenient posture in bed, and but little tossing about and iniquitude of the body. So, I mean, other than the flowery uh, Victorian uh, English, because this was, I think, translated in the 1840s, uh, 
you can understand what it is. It basically tells you that, you know, the less severe the symptoms are, the more likely people are to recover. Uh, and this was um, written, you know, in the, uh, around 925 AD. So this already tells you a couple of things, that smallpox and measles have been around long enough uh, for people to have uh, amassed uh, some degree of uh, understanding of what the symptoms are and some of the treatments are, and to provide um, uh, uh, enough information to realize that there are different diseases. And this is not, uh, and, and, you know, uh, like this book says, they're actually uh, quite similar in many manifestations. So initial uh, symptoms of smallpox and measles might be quite similar until we get the, post the pustules and um, the skin manifestations. But anyway, so this is, you know, 1200 years ago. Uh, moving a little bit, um, you know, further into the present, uh, there was a, um, uh, in 2016, there was a short piece um, written in JAMA. There's nothing particular about this piece. It's just uh, a convenient, uh, it, it ha it's short and has, um, you know, nice figures. Uh, but we have historical data that, that, that reaches back, you know, many decades, um, in some cases, you know, over a century. So you can start looking at long-term trends. Um, and one of the things um, that you, uh, uh, you might not realize, and a few people have been making this argument, that we're actually, despite the current hiccup in the grand scheme of things, that's, uh, uh, you know, what it'll probably turn out to be, uh, we are still doing a lot better than pretty much any past generation. So if you look at, uh, for, for instance, the um, trends in uh, various causes of death, right? So here's a trend in the United States from uh, the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, down to 2014. You can see uh, by looking at uh, this time series, a couple of things. Um, so one, you see all causes of death, uh, they're decreasing over time. Uh, so what do you think the spike is in, um, you know, around 1920? Uh, do, do you have any guesses? You can either type or, uh, you know, tell me. The Great War or the pandemic? Yeah, so it's, it's either World War I, which, you know, wasn't as dramatic in the United States. It would be much, much worse in Europe. But yeah, this is the Spanish flu. This is the 1918 flu pandemic. And this is a giant spike, right? So it, uh, you know, basically uh, overall mortality went by, um, you know, increased by what looks like from about, you know, 1,300 to about 1,800 per thousand, uh, 100,000 population. And then you basically have a steady downward march uh, of this mortality that's flattening towards the end. And then it's even more dramatically, so not infectious causes that would be, you know, accidents, um, you know, uh, heart disease and other, uh, you know, types of uh, uh, conditions that, you know, kill people, that is fairly steady. But if you look at the infectious disease, and you can kind of uh, see that this is in World War I because you have a corresponding spike in infectious disease cause and all causes, infectious disease rate has plummeted. But it hasn't quite plummeted to zero, right? So you, we went, but it was a dramatic increase. So there are a couple of things uh, uh, that you might uh, recognize. So, you know, here between 1940 and 1960, so you have the advent uh, of antibiotics and sort of a rollout of very successful vaccines, um, you know, for things like uh, polio and measles. But then you have this bump uh, in the late um, uh, 20th century, and then it sort of trends back down again. Um, so if you look at um, uh, sort of a more recent time scale, uh, you will notice that new, um, new diseases, you know, enter the human population with some regularity, and they're quite different um, in, in um, scope and nature. So for instance, the biggest um, pandemic uh, of uh, the 1980s was, with, without question, in, in the early 1990s, was HIV AIDS. Um, and uh, it was a lot scarier. I mean, if you, if you read contemporary books about what it was like, uh, you know, getting HIV was effectively a death sentence. Nobody recovered from it uh, before the advent of uh, highly active uh, antiretroviral therapy. And initially, it was a lot of confusion and misinformation about how it spread. Uh, but you can see here that there was no HIV AIDS in the 1980s. Then it goes up, and it almost reaches the same level of... Um, 
mortality is seasonal influenza of pneumonia, which is sort of a background, a constant background hum. I mean, it's been around uh, since, as far as we know, uh, the various forms of influenza of pneumonia. And then you can see there was a spike uh, that culminated in 1996, which is when um, the effective treatment against HIV AIDS was introduced. And, uh, you know, there's still, it's still non-zero, but you have uh, a constant downward uh, trends. Uh, there's a question, I guess, infectious disease causes plummeting might be a, uh, a good thing, but doesn't that make us more susceptible in terms of lack of immunity to novel aberrant infectious diseases? Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, we still get them, right? It's just they're not as deadly. Um, uh, and and we'll, we'll come back to this uh, in a second. So here, here's an example of um, novel infectious disease that you might not have heard about because it occurs at a very, very low rate. So we're talking about uh, you know, fewer than one death per million. Uh, but there's a definite spike in these, uh, you know, exotic diseases like vector-borne diseases, which are, you know, tra usually transmitted by mosquitoes. This is the most common vector. But like West Nile virus, for instance, was uh, just not present, and then it was imported and sort of exists at a low level. Uh, and then um, the other things that occur is the um, introduction of vaccines. Right, or vaccine preventable diseases. And you don't see the big drop because that would have happened before 1980, but it's sort of constantly you know, dropping down. Uh, so streptococcus pneumonia is your standard bacterial infection. You have Titus B, doesn't have a particularly effective vaccine. And this spike um, here is actually co-infection. Um, you know, it, it tend to co-occur with um, HIV. Uh, one of the issues now is drug resistance. So if you remember, um, you know, about 20 years ago, we thought that all bacterial pathogens had been conquered because of the broad array of antibiotics, but now we have multi-drug multi resistant strains. And in some cases, Locustridium difficile, um, which is um, a particularly um, a, 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 a bacterium uh, that is particularly uh, susceptible, not particularly susceptible, particularly adept at uh, uh, acquiring drug resistance. Uh, the you know fecal transplant is one of the purported treatments for Clostridium difficile, uh, but it's uh, the 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 spike here is due to drug resistance. Uh, and you know, put it in numbers, um, you can see that uh, you know, despite the fact that we have you know science and technology advanced a lot between 1980 and 2014, there hasn't been a significant drop. Uh, like influenza and pneumonia is basically the same rate. Influenza is the same rate, pneumonia the same rate. Of course, in 1980, there was no HIV. A lot of this um, increase is due to HIV. Transient, you see, was increasing rapidly at an annual, average annual percentage change of about 85% until uh, the introduction of successful treatment. And then it's on a downward trend. Uh, you know, eventually we'll eliminate it. And then you see Clostridium um, difficile again drug resistance. So infectious diseases are there uh, and they're probably, you know, barring some brilliant new technology like, you know, smart nanoparticles that just find individual uh, viral or bacterial pathogens and kill them. We're not going to be able to eliminate them because they change. We see new things that we didn't anticipate. Uh, and um, so what we can do is manage uh, and, and reduce rates. Questions, could you explain why mortality rate overall doesn't drop even with vaccines or new technology? Uh, so good question, all right? So we don't have a successful vaccine for influenza, for instance, and influenza is chasing, uh, is running one step ahead of the vaccine. So we have annual vaccines for influenza, which are sort of marginally effective in most years. So we basically don't have uh, a successful, um, the vaccine for influenza is not nearly as successful as, you know, for things like measles, measles or smallpox. Uh, and some of the um, some of the increase is due to the development of drug resistance. So, for example, here you see you have an increase. Uh, so, for, for example, vaccine preventable diseases went from 2.1 to 0.08. But on the other hand, you have this Clostridium difficile, basically offsetting that because it's now a um, a very common case of hospital uh, uh, you know hospital acquired infections is a common place. But this is. Uh, a sort of a very a notorious pathogen that has uh, drug resistance issues. And you have new pathogens entering um, uh, the human population because of a variety of things that we'll discuss a little later. Uh, 
So you can think of this as sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, you can have uh, a qualitative shift, like the introduction of antibiotics kind of changed the entire game. The introduction of successful vaccines changed the entire game. The introduction of successful treatment against HIV was a game changer. A lot of the other things are incremental. So you see small changes in one area that we focus on, but then something else comes up to uh, bring it about, uh, to sort of counterbalance it in the other direction. Now, let's look at um, COVID-19, um, right? So let's, you know, there's, uh, there's a variety of different sites. I, I, I found this one, which basically aggregates Johns Hopkins data. And there is one um, that they use live data. So this is from today. Uh, what I did here is I've sorted um, the, um, uh, I sorted um, countries by the last column. So the deaths per million in the last seven days to see which countries are at the moment seem to be having the worst um, spikes uh, uh, of um, uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths, because I'm sure you've read uh, that the cases are back up in Europe uh, and pretty much everywhere else. And you know, France is another round of lockdowns, which we'll discuss later, not today, but another lecture, sort of non-medical interventions. But you can see that um, uh, uh, Czechia and Belgium, which are two small countries in Europe, lead uh, the pack in this unfortunate statistics. Then you have Argentina, North Macedonia, Armenia, which are also European um, countries, you know, Tunisia and Africa and so on. Um, if you sort by, um, so you can go back and um, look at this table in different categories, you can sort by the total deaths in which, you know, we lead uh, and then, um, you know, uh, deaths per million, I, I think the United States is at the bottom of the top 10. Uh, but it's, um, you know, one of the things you can see here, for example, looking at these types of data, and this is something you might want to use, you know, when you do your analysis, is, um, you know, there's very heterogeneous response across countries, and there seems to be very little, um, with a few exceptions, very little predictability, um, you know, but if the country's doing well now, does it mean it's going to be leading the pack, you know, in the next month or so? Uh, and the only exception is probably New Zealand because it's an island and they had a very, very strict uh, intervention program, uh, which cannot really be replicated in almost, you know, in, in many other uh, locations. So another source of data, um, which um, how many people have uh, seen uh, data that's not just a number of total deaths, but in terms of excess mortality, um, or it's called, uh, you know, um, mortality displacement. Uh, have you guys seen this statistic or, or this value bandied about? Oh, all right, so some no, some yes. So this is a different way. Um, uh, it's a different way to look at um, the various uh, um, sources of death, right? So one of the things that um, happened with COVID is because it's such a prominent and sort of, it's sort of constantly in the news, it's the front of your mind. You tend to forget uh, that there are all these other causes of death. Some of them are unavoidable. I mean, people will die of old age. Nobody lives forever. You know, people will continue to die from other causes like heart disease and cancer. And there's a normal background rate of death, right? That has been tabulated and modeled over time. It changes, and I'll show you a couple of curves. Uh, and what you can see when you look at excess mortality is you can see if any particular reason, any particular season sort of sticks out of the normal. Um, and, uh, and the definition of excess mortality to all causes um, is defined as a temporary increase in the number of deaths and the important thing is relative to the expected numbers in a given population due to, for example, things like natural disasters, epidemics or pandemics, famine or war. So all of these things are um, transient, right? Temporary, unless you have some structural changes and you know, it will go extinct, uh, which I hope doesn't happen. But the important thing here is what is the reference? Right? There's always going to be some number of deaths that is considered normal. Um, and that is what you want to measure things relative to. You do not want to look at absolute numbers because they might not, I mean, unless it's a huge number like millions upon millions, you know it's abnormal. But you always want to look relative to some appropriate uh, seasonal reference. So for instance, um, 
here's a chart uh, from the European um, Surveillance uh, Consortium, and we'll look at these live data in a few seconds. And this is a very useful uh, type of information, which shows you a couple of important um, uh, features to notice here. Uh, so one, this is aggregated over multiple European countries. Um, you will see several things shown here. So let's first understand what's being plotted. Uh, this is a time series. Uh, if you look at the x-axis, uh, you see major marks indicating years, so 2017, 2018. Uh, the decimal, oh, so the integers between them are weeks, right? So this is 17 weeks into 2017, 34 weeks. And the reason for it is this is usually a weekly measurement. You have this gray um, dashed line that goes like in a sinusoidal pattern. This is the normal expected death rate uh, for uh, these European countries. Uh, so you can see, you, uh, you, you can already see a couple of uh, uh, interesting observations. Uh, so one is periodic, right? So you might have seen, um, I mean, there's this anecdote uh, that, um, you know, um, a lot of people die at the beginning of the year, right? And fewer people die in, in, the, sp in, in the summer. And you can see this pattern repeated. And this is not a subtle, I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a twofold difference, but we're talking about the baseline uh, uh, death um, in absolute numbers going from, you know, about 40,000 at the bottom to what looks like about 55,000, oh, sorry, about 45,000. Uh, to maybe about 55,000. So it's a seasonal pattern. Uh, the gray pattern is normal range. So you expect some fluctuation from year to year. It's not gonna be exactly the same. And the red line is what would be considered an abnormally high deviation. So this is outside the normal range. So you have to look for some transient causes. And the solid line is what you actually observe, right? So this is um, the actual, um, actual um, uh, causes actual recorded deaths. So there are a couple of things you can see from that as well, uh, right? So for one thing, in at least here, in all of these years, uh, there is at least a couple of weeks every year where the number of deaths is significantly above the expected um, normal range, right? So here, and it all happens, these all tend to be um, uh, attributed to influenza deaths, which is a seasonal disease that, you know, the, the, the peaks in the winter or early um, uh, you know, fall, winter depends on the year. Uh, and then here you see a spike uh, in COVID, which was then brought down to almost within normal range and we're here now, so we'll see where we go there. So this is, uh, this is one way to look at the data um, to, to sort of basically shows you not just absolute numbers, but whether or not these numbers are outside the normal range. Uh, in the United States, uh, the analogous um, uh, uh, agency that tracks this is the CDC. Um, and, um, you know, here's, um, this is a slightly different plot, um, uh, but it shows the same kind of data. So one thing, it's a much more uh, compressed, uh, sorry, much more zoomed in plot, so it only looks at 2020. But it, it has the same um, uh, uh, values plotted here. So you, you have the solid line, which is the average expected number of deaths. Uh, the dashed line is the upper bound uh, threshold for expected number of deaths. So this is, you know, anything below that is the normal range. And then the solid um, area plots is all causes, uh, you know, the, the, the higher peak, uh, the lighter color. And then these are all causes excluding COVID-19. Uh, so there is, uh, uh, so let me first take a question. How are they defining causes excluding COVID-19? Are they considering com comorbidities per se? Uh, it is, I'm not prepared to answer this question definitively because uh, different jurisdictions are responsible for recording the cause of deaths. And there's been a significant uh, variation between states and localities about you know, how they determine the cause of death, but there is a standard procedure. And in some cases it's ambiguous, right? So, you know, for instance, in, in, in some cases, if you have a patient with a lot of comorbidities, say, you know, renal failure or congenital heart disease, 
and they're, you know, 90 years old and they die and they have COVID, you know, in most cases, they will be recorded as dying of COVID, but it's a little bit complicated to say, you know, sure, it contributed to their death, but was, was that the death factor? It's, and it's, uh, so I would imagine over time, you know, when this is reviewed and revised, some of the numbers will change, but the ballpark is, um, is sort of under, you know, uh, not going to change that much because we're talking about significant numbers. Uh, so here's the other thing. It's, um, you know, weekly. So notice that you have weekly deaths on the order of 60,000 people in the United States on an average normal week are expected to die. So this is, you know, over 3 million every year. Uh, in a normal year, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, so, you know, what do you see uh, from this chart? Uh, so, you know, the first thing that you obviously see is, you know, the big spike um, at the uh, end of March and April, beginning of April. And, you know, the first spike and then it sort of dropped down and the, it came back up and then it dropped down. The other thing you can see is that there was a, an increase, a subtler, uh, increase in other uh, causes, which are also above normal. So what do you think some of those are? Have you seen anything, you know, any reports that say uh, uh, the deaths uh, uh, in other categories, uh, excluding COVID-19, are increasing? I'm just curious, as, uh, have you guys seen any other uh, reports? What, what, some, what are some of the other things that might be uh, increasing uh, that, are, that are not COVID? Anyone? All right, could be. All right, pneumonia. So suicide, suicide is definitely um, uh, a factor of just accidental death due to things like drug overdoses, alcohol abuse, uh, coronary heart disease. So yeah, all of these things. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys are sort of touching on the main points. Uh, and um, uh, it, it just, um, uh, it, it just goes to show, yes, yeah, so a delayed cancer treatment maybe. So all of those things could contribute. And you're right, it is anecdotal at the moment, but you can start collecting the data through these types of mechanisms to uh, 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 begin to appreciate that this is what's called a syndemic, right? Syndemic is a fancy word that says when you have a significant disruption to the system, uh, you know, a variety of things over time will start playing together to sort of exacerbate the effect of one, in, one another. Uh, so here's another way to look at these data, which is just the excess. So they basically, you know, remove the uh, the baseline and just amplify the difference. So this way that basically measures how many additional deaths uh, you had per, um, uh, you know, week. So I'm going to take um, a little pause here and we're going to look at, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to switch over to um, a browser and we're just going to look at some of these uh, resources. I think these are great. Um, all right, so this is the European um, surveillance system. And you can see, you know, 26 out of 24 uh, participating country. So these are uh, the European countries. And this is an interactive plot. Uh, which gives you, um, you know, a lot of additional information. So this is the uh, chart, the static. I, I showed you a screenshot of this chart. Uh, you can slide, you know, you can zoom in or out. You can see a specific period. Uh, but you can break it down by some of the known covariates. So, for instance, um, if you look at, this is the overall population. If you look at, uh, you know, children and teenagers, there's absolutely nothing abnormal about this year. They're right at about 300 deaths per, um, per week, which is the normal. Uh, there's almost nothing abnormal, but perhaps a little spike here uh, about um, sort of adults up to um, you know, 44 years old. And then when you start moving into the older demographics, this is where you see you know, the ever increasing effect uh, of COVID where you, know, you, you see this big spike in 45 to 64, even bigger spike in 65 to 74, an even bigger spike, 75 to 84, uh, and then, you know, broken down by two other uh, categories, right? It's especially, uh, but the other thing you might notice is that, of course, they have different baseline death rates. 
right? So, uh, and this is also perfectly normal because older people, you know, have an increased risk of dying from any cause just because they're older. So the baseline death, for example, for 15 to 44 uh, year old is about, you know, 1200 per week. If you move up to 85 or older, uh, now the baseline is 20,000 uh, per week. Uh, you can also redraw this plot using cult, something called a z-score. Um, a z-score is a statistical measure of how many standard deviations away from the mean this measurement is. So zero means it's, it's an average, and a value of 50 means it's 50 times uh, outside the average. So this is very, very unusual. A z-score of about two is considered to be statistically significant. So 50 is dramatic. So this is just a statistical way to reinterpret the same data. Uh, if you scroll down, uh, you can look at, um, this is excess mortality you know, plotted a different way in terms of cumulative deaths um, over a specific you know, three different years, uh, again, broken down by um, region. And then here you can see um, animations, um, and you can just drag this, uh, and this is color coded, so you know, no COVID, no COVID, and here you can see man, just nothing going on. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go to the 13th week of 2020, and basically it's all over the place, all right? And then it drops down, that's sort of, you have hot spots and now it's going back up. Uh, you can also go very, very detailed and look at, um, you know, what's going on in individual countries uh, by age and so on. So these types of data, um, and it's important to realize that the reason these data exist is because there's a specific program uh, that was designed uh, uh, to uh, track um, epidemic diseases. And a lot of this was originally motivated by uh, tracking the severity of influenza, but now we're benefiting uh, from this um, data collection infrastructure. Um, so if you look at the CDC, there is a um, uh, you know, different interface. Uh, but you basically will get access to the same type of data um, where you can look at, um, you know, so here's um, the excess mortality uh, and stars means it's outside. Yeah, you know, if you have if you have a plus next to it, it means it's statistically significantly outside the normal range. So see there was a blip uh, for the influenza season here uh, in 2018 and then everything else was normal until COVID arrived. Uh, and you can also look at um, Excess deaths within, without COVID. Uh, you can break it down by uh, you know various causes of disease. Um, you can look at you know jurisdictions, which in this case is a state. You can see causes of death. And you can select which ones you want to display. So, for instance. Um, we can look at, um, so there's Pennsylvania right here. Uh, so it's important to realize that people are still dying um, of a lot of other causes uh, in addition to um, uh, COVID. And then uh, the last, resource and the links are all in the, um, so these are just general mortality trends. This doesn't have anything to do with um, uh, COVID. This is just uh, an exploratory um, um, you know, summary statistic of uh, you know, death rates. Uh, and this goes over a much longer range, so from 1900 to the present day. And one of the interesting things, for example, you can see here, is that the 1918 epidemic basically hit all the age groups and the spike in the age group of one to four, you know, was basically just as bad. So infants and small children uh, as it is for everybody else, which is definitely not uh, the case uh, presently. All right, so now I'll uh, switch back to uh, my presentation. Just give me a moment. All right, so th these are the slides and these types of resources I think will be very useful for you when you sort of start collecting uh, you know, data for your presentation.
Uh, so now, um, uh, you know, I, I just want to, um, uh, sorry, those are the few more questions. So baseline means average. No, baseline, baseline just means normal, normal expectations. So whatever is um, uh, not out of the ordinary. So just the normal rate of death. And then in terms of COVID susceptibility, I saw a small bar portion dedicated to Alzheimer's related death. Would this also be considered a pre-existing condition for patients susceptible of dying from COVID? Uh, I mean, technically anything can be a pre-existing condition. I'm not aware uh, of any, uh, if Alzheimer's is independently a, a predictor of uh, a worse COVID outcome, but Alzheimer's is just generally a, a, a disease that is confounded with a lot of other things. You know, for one thing, it's, it tends to be, um, a lot of Alzheimer's cases happen in people over 65. Once you get in that point, it's, you know, age becomes the primary determinant fa factor. Uh, so what do you think, um, you know, can happen to a new pathogen when it starts an epidemic or a pandemic? So what are, what are some of the uh, possible scenarios uh, that, 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 the, that, that a new pathogen can take? You know, just think historically. Um, so what, what do you think, what, what are the potential scenarios? Where, where can this COVID-19 epidemic go? Uh, and you guys can, you know, if, if you want to, you can, you can, you, you can just talk, uh, you can say, no, I, I don't mean it, what, what happens to the pathogen. Forget about the pathogen. Just, you know, what, what do you think what's going to happen to it? You know, it can, um, you know, we, we, for example, we can successfully eradicate it. All right. So one possibility is reach herd immunity and basically become kind of like a, a, a any other respiratory disease. All right. That's one outcome. Uh, what else can happen? Not necessarily COVID-19, but you know, what, what are the differences? It can become a seasonal pathogen. Um, Could it be something that just disappears with time? Like weren't there cases of like, I mean, even for like MERS and like SARS-CoV-1, like didn't they kind of just disappear for the most part, like just degenerate in a way? Correct. It could, it could, right? So it could just, it could just basically you know, fail to uh, spread. But technically it is only, uh, so an epidemic can be local, but I think once you start talking about a pandemic, it, it assumes that you have system, systemic uh, transmission. Uh, a, hopefully not, I don't think, we don't want it to recombine with other pathogens. It would be some sort of a crazy superbug. Uh, I, I don't think it's actually possible for it to recombine with things that are not coronaviruses, uh, unless we do it uh, deliberately. But some of the other things that can happen, um, Right, so obviously, I mean, if you just look in the past, there has not been a pandemic that killed everyone. That only happens in movies, and even then a couple of people survive, so it's not going to be a zombie apocalypse. Uh, it, it, we, we could successfully eradicate a pathogen, uh, either by um, uh, you know, a, a very effective vaccine, uh, and it's not going to happen over time. Um, or it could, um, yeah, so I mean, I think a, a lot of you guys basically have the same intuition, which is I do. So all, all this, all the signs point to uh, uh, COVID-19 becoming sort of a persistent seasonal epidemic. Um, and, and I think a lot of the information that, uh, that we, we, we learned about immunology and state of the vaccines points to uh, that possibility. Uh, so this also, um, but that's important to keep in mind what the possible outcomes are when we talk about interventions, right? Because you will have very different uh, uh, sort of metrics of success if your goal is a complete eradication as opposed to having a managed seasonal disease. Obviously, complete eradication is desirable, but it's much, much harder. And we have not been able to do this without a uh, strongly, um, uh, uh, you know, very, very effective vaccine. And even then it takes, um, and I'll show you some slides, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, there's a question why do viruses become seasonal? I have a whole section at the end of this um, lecture to talk about seasonality. Uh, it is actually an open question. So there's still a lot of debate about why viruses become seasonal. Uh, seasonality has to do with basically fluctuations in cases and there, there are a couple of factors that can go to it. So, you know, uh, uh, what tools are available for quote unquote fighting the pandemic? Um, so what do you guys think? What can we do? Uh, one possibility is to do nothing. 
so you can have all right so you can, our brains right so you know we can basically uh come up with a cure uh masks um or you know i, I would bend this in so all of these things like mask restrict international travel travel so we can sort of all lump it un, uh, under the category of non-medical interventions or nmis uh, not panic i like that one uh, so reasonable behavior so uh, we have um, now in terms of what has been successful in the past, right? So, you know, we can learn. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we can do, um, yeah, so we can protect the, yeah, so we can do lots of different things. That's right. So, we can, uh, uh, so they're basically, um, you know, three areas of vulnerability for any uh, pathogen. We can have a, an effective treatment, right? So, we allow, you know, if people become infected but they can be reliably cured. That's one possibility. We can have a vaccine that is highly, highly effective. Um, yeah, and, you know, and, and obviously I, I see a lot of comments about um, sort of just reasonable societal response. You know, do, do the sensible thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we can do anything about that because people historically have uh, always acted uh, unpredictably. Uh, so we can we can treat we can vaccinate or we can try to um, you know uh, 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 eliminate transmission. We have been successful with um, treatment. We have been successful with vaccination. This is pretty much the first time uh, you know we're trying uh, as a prevention this very large scale uh, non medical intervention. And all I'm going to say now is that if anybody tells you now that it's effective or ineffective, don't listen to them because we don't have the information. We have some information, but we don't have um, sufficient information to decide what works and what doesn't. We're basically doing um, a clinical trial without any controls. Um, so we need to have, um, well, we'll discuss that in a separate lecture, but three sort of three prongs. So treatment, vaccine, or non-medical interventions, which, would, which are aimed at basically slowing down or stopping the transmission to a point where the virus is not able to sustain itself. Uh, and this is all, um, just, just keep that in mind. And we're trying all three, obviously, right? Uh, so, you know, we know there are a lot of vaccines in the pipeline. We know there have been treatments, you know, even though they're now controversial. And we're trying all kinds of interventions. Um, so uh, next, I'm gonna move over and give you some basic epidemiological concepts that you might want to uh, be, want to be familiar with in order to understand uh, uh, you know what's being written up in the um, in literature so there is you know modeling infectious disease dynamics in the complex landscape of global health oh I just noticed Simon Frost is in the author line he was my um, postdoctoral advisor um, so yeah he's a very clever guy now works for uh, Microsoft research so this is a very useful paper that's really accessible um, uh, a question, what were the non-medical interventions we mentioned again, please? So anything that is not a vaccine or a treatment, right? So, you know, uh, uh, social distancing, lockdowns, travel restrictions, masks, uh, all, anything that is not directly either treating the condition or um, creating immunity. And there's, there's a whole array of those things that we've tried and things we haven't tried. Uh, so in the 1960s and 70s, it was believed that infectious disease was quote unquote conquered. And it was sort of a very uh, heady time. You know, antibiotics, uh, diseases like measles have been eliminated. Unfortunately, uh, as I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, this didn't continue to zero. Uh, so overall, worldwide, every year, uh, we will have expected until by 2030, uh, 13 to 15 million deaths from infectious disease per year worldwide, right? So this is a normal year. We have seen uh, the emergence of many new pathogens in the last 25 and 30 years. Uh, HIV, new strains of, avian, uh, of influenza A, Ebola, Zika, you know, SARS-CoV-2 and 1 and MERS and all these other things. Uh, a new factor that has um, uh, uh, promoted the persistence of infectious diseases, microbial resistance to treatment, uh, but a lot of things um, that are non, um, 
uh, uh, you know, not directly related to disease, but rather are related to the hosts. So there's a much higher population density now than there's ever been in the past in big cities. Uh, I don't have it uh, at the moment, but there was this great um, animation. I might look it up and post it because I, it was just so striking. Uh, somebody wrote um, uh, an animation of um, the largest cities in the world going back to ancient times, like basically going to you know Rome and ancient Greece, and it goes through time. You can see both how population moves from region to region because at various you know times in history, different parts of the world used to be the central you know hubs of innovation or um, uh, uh, you know desirability. So you know Mesopotamia. Constantinople, the British Empire, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, so higher population density and travel, this obviously, you know, increases transmissibility, travel, you know, spreads it around. You also have things like increased livestock production because there's more people, there's more meat consumption. Livestock production uh, is important because a lot of the diseases, well, actually most of the diseases that we know of came to us from animals. And there's this great quote, um, which I think this, I deliberately picked papers that were written before 2020 because uh, a, a lot of the things uh, now will be uh, unfortunately slanted to favor one or another point of view. So I try to avoid this. Uh, and changing behavior of individuals in response to publicity about epidemics can have profound effects on the course of the outbreak. So this is a very prophetic statement uh, because obviously the way we react, this becomes a, a couple system. So what we do in response to the disease influences the disease in the other way around. And vaccine development challenges uh, are still there that haven't been overcome. So we don't have vaccines for HIV or influenza because they're highly genetically diverse. We have vaccines that need to be boosted periodically because they uh, wane over time. We have some vaccines that are very narrow action. So it's not as universal as we would like. A uh, question for Zika related death. Do you also consider the mortality of children who were born with uh, microcephaly or anencephaly? Uh, uh, similarly for COVID, do you consider long-term effects as causes for mortality? Uh, I, I think it's really irrelevant what I consider a, a cause of death because there's, you know, a standard a mechanism for reporting. Uh, 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 so for Zika-related death, obviously, you know, birth defect uh, that, that's directly related to a virus is, um, uh, you know, is, is much more proximal. When we're talking about long-term effects, um, I think at some point you have to call, uh, you know, statute of limitations because, you know, if you die 20 years after the infection, uh, pretty much the only disease that I know can, do, there are two diseases that can do it to you. There's HIV or some other chronic disease that literally continues replicating in you, which could be the case for COVID, it just hasn't been long enough, um, or cancer, right? But cancer usually, you know, it it's basically has to be a chronic disease. Uh, but it's, it's really tricky. Uh, there are a lot of complications that have been revealed um, because of um, COVID that we didn't know about. Uh, why is there no vaccination for HSV? Well, I mean, herpes, um, I mean, herpes is a family of viruses. Uh, I, I think there's some of, um, I think there's some, um, there might, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll look it up for you. It's a good question. Uh, but there's more than one herpes virus. So, uh, modeling infectious disease um, has been in the for I'm sure you've all seen models. Uh, you know, a lot of the interventions that we took, uh, we undertook in, in the United States and other countries in March uh, were based on modeling predictions. But there's a lot of misconceptions about what models can and cannot do and what they have been successfully used for in the past. Uh, so modeling infectious disease, um, and I would consider myself as doing some aspect of it, even though I don't do, you know, like, prediction and, and epidemic and mostly work with sequence data. But the main goals of infectious disease modeling would be, um, there are actually a lot of goals and I just like to sort of bring them up. So for instance, collect and analyze complex data. Uh, so before you can make any predictions, you actually need to have something to work with. And the resources like I showed you from epidemiological tracking in Europe and the CDC are very um, laborious and they need to be put in place. So we need to be able to track uh, cases over time, record, have access to them. You know, there are different sources of data that we need to track off, track uh, and, and, and interpret. So this is a very important part that usually doesn't get mentioned. If you don't have data, there's nothing you can do. You can just speculate, but it's pointless without data. Uh, then you want to uh, estimate various important properties of pathogen. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what some of those are. The most important thing to realize is that most of the things that you want to know about the pathogen 
or a lot of them cannot be measured. Only some of them can be measured. Um, and many have to be inferred or estimated. And whenever you do inference or estimation, it is by necessity imprecise. Uh, and, and I'll give you examples of this later on. And then and perhaps the first thing that comes to your mind when, when you mention modeling or I mentioned modeling, it's the ability to predict things. You know, for instance, you might want to be able to predict epi epidemic trajectories um, or to predict the impact of interventions um, or, uh, you know, various healthcare metrics like hospital utilization or, you know, just, just things like this. So let me hop over to, um, let me just copy this over um, here just a second. And I'll show you. Um, before COVID, um, the um, no, one moment. There we go. Let me stop share. So before COVID. One of the biggest areas of um, prediction, at least in the United States, had to do with influenza, uh, seasonal influenza. So there is um, uh, a whole epidemic prediction initiative for, um, that's run by the CDC. So the top of it is now COVID-19 forecasting. We'll look at it in a second. Uh, so 80s challenge is basically the distribution of mosquitoes because there are important factors, you know, West Nile virus, you know, you can look at things like um, state flu. So what the CDC has been doing for a while is basically running prediction competitions uh, where they want specific metrics uh, to be predicted, right? And you can sort of scroll around and look at this, but uh, let me just show you. Uh, so this is a seasonal influenza um, uh, uh, prevalence. And one of the metrics that they have is ILI. So uh, in influenza-like illness, that's what an abbreviation is basically when you have respiratory uh, symptoms, you have fever, so something that looks like influenza but might not be influenza. It's a good proxy for um, an influenza-like disease. It's also important to pause here and, and, and realize, you know, that before this, people would not necessarily even be routinely tested for COVID, uh, not COVID, but for influenza. So you would use proxy measures like something that presents like an influenza, but it could in fact be something else. So this is a very crude aggregate measure, but this is easy to uh, report. Uh, and this is a typical trend in the United States over time. Um, so sorry, this is in Alabama. So let's look what um, the trend was like in Pennsylvania. Uh, right. So they want to have state level predictions and you will have, um, you know, a calendar year. So there was, you know, some baseline um, rate. And then um, in the winter season, it peaks, you know, and you'll have some oscillations. And these, uh, so this is, the, this is what was actually measured. And these dots are what the different models colored here predicted. Um, and, and basically what the CDC usually wants you to predict is when is the peak, right? So what's gonna be the busiest week? Um, and you know, what is gonna be the highest uh, uh, prevalence? Uh, so interestingly enough, um, so you have all these models here. So each of these things, you can click on them and it's gonna tell you, um, no, it's not gonna tell you here, you can look at the, different models. So all of these things are individual models that have been submitted by, you know, various uh, academic and other teams. Uh, and this historical average and unweighted average are very dumb predictors, so to speak, which is basically just what happened at this week in the past, right? So this is just, you look at historical data and you try to predict, you know, what would happen in a normal season by just averaging what happened in the past 10 or 15 seasons. And you can see this is basically spot on. <laughs> Um, right, whereas a lot of the models are, are, are off. So, uh, and I'm not going to talk about it too much. Uh, suffice it to say that we have not been very successful historically to, uh, in predicting um, influenza seasons, especially if they're unusual, right? If there's a peak at an unusual week, most of the models fail to predict, and they've been doing it for a long time. So prediction is a hard problem that we haven't been able to solve even for systems. Uh, so and if you look at COVID-19 forecasting, and we'll look at it, um, some more. So there's the COVID-19 forecast hub. Um, definitely a lot of pretty graphics now. <laughs> 
All right, so you can look at, uh, again, you can look at Pennsylvania. Uh, so incident deaths would basically be um, the number of deaths that are predicted to occur um, uh, at a particular period. So this is absolute counts. Uh, and this is what happened in, in PA historically. This is the current time. And, and this is the prediction of a particular model. And whenever you're looking at a prediction like this, um, so I'll just turn off all the models. You can do what's called ensemble prediction. So all these different models. Um, all right, so let me ask you this. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you look at these models and if you were, if you were a decision maker today, uh, what do you think you know, is likely to happen in Pennsylvania in terms of COVID-related deaths in the next couple of weeks. So this is today, right? This is a historical pathway to peak and then it kind of steadied out and bounced around. And these are all the different models. So the solid lines, the different models is what they're predicting the most likely interval is. And these, the shaded areas is the level of uncertainty. Uh, uh, so, I mean, if you were to pick, um, and I, I don't have the chat window in front of me, so if you're gonna say something, you know, if you could just jump in and say it. Uh, just a plan for the worst one, I guess. Yeah, so the worst one, uh, right, I mean, that's reasonable. Um, so, you know, what, what do you think is a reasonable uh, assumption when you, um, you know, if you have a lot of conflicting information, if, if you basically poll, you know, 10 different models and they all give you a number, uh, uh, you know, how, how would you decide which one to trust? Just go with the average. That's a great suggestion. Go with the average. It's the wisdom of the crowds, right? The, um, right. Uh, what are some of the other strategies? I would also consider the level of uncertainty within like the highest and the lowest model because, you know, it varies a lot and you don't want to take the worst outcome and end up with like better kind of outcomes because in the sense, if you have like mass shortages, um, you want to basically consider some, you want to consider the level of uncertainty there is between the two models. Okay, right, because, so, no, I mean, uh, that's a great suggestion because you actually want to, um, uh, you don't want to, uh, th th there, there, there's a cost of doing things, right? So Yeah, you don't want to, like, oversell yourself and then, like, end up with shortages or, like, correct too many things. Yeah, so I mean, if, if you if you look at the averages, it looks like, you know, if, if these models are uh, any good, we're basically expecting something close to flat, you know, maybe a little increase. But the other thing you can take from this is there's a lot of uncertainty, right? If you look at the band, I mean, it goes anywhere from no deaths, which is not terribly likely, so you can almost reject that. I mean, you can expect some deaths from COVID, uh, and the range is like from zero to 600. Uh, it's, a not, it's not an insignificant amount. Uh, and then you can start looking at, you know, bigger states. And if you look at the national uh, average, you're going to have, you know, obviously everything is aggregated. But here the pattern is actually quite different because some models say nothing changes, might even go down. Some models are quite pessimistic. And again, the range is anywhere from zero to 16,000 deaths per week. Uh, so this already highlights, you know, some of the issues. If you're a public health official that wants to use this information, to make decisions, you have to choose, right? And, and, and how do you choose? And, and this is, there's no objective measure for doing this. You could look at the past performance. Uh, it's almost like investing in the stock market in the sense, even though I don't want to make that comparison because it's a lot of gambling, but there's some informative, informativeness in there. Uh, but what these models typically fail to do, if there's something that is not built into the model, if, if the epidemic is going to do something that is new or different, then the models are not likely to be able to predict it because they learn from past, past behavior and try to predict the future in most cases. Uh, so here's, um, but they do the ensemble um, uh, prediction as well. So there's, a, a, the ensemble prediction is basically where you try to aggregate, uh, uh, basically take sort of a weighted average from different uh, different models, and you weigh them based on how uh, on various criteria. For instance, you can you can upweight the model that has done better in the past, uh, and you can you can do, you can sort of discount models that have uh, uh, performed poorly. Uh, so here's an example of how um, you know sort of this cartoon idea of a successful um, 
uh, uh, you know, case of public health intervention. So, uh, you know, w which is based on modeling. So you have a specific policy question, you know, should rubella vaccinations be introduced? And if so, who should be targeted? And say, when should uh, large age range campaigns be conducted? Uh, so you start by collecting data, right? Which would be a time series of, you know, cases in young kids and cases in old kids. So uh, less than 15 and you know, greater than 15. Then you build a model. We'll ta I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about models, but this is just a schematic of a model. Uh, then you, 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 know, you crank through this model and then you use the interpretation of the model to uh, you know, give policy advice. So the policy advice based on this model and the data would be introduce only when minimum coverage is achieved, which may depend on birth rate. Transfer targeting only girls to including it into routine vaccination if coverage is sufficiently high, consider vaccine heterogeneity. Then you collect more data, confirm that the model prediction is correct, and then you potentially give differential outcomes. So in this case, you know, the example here is that you, you have two um, important variables that are identified by the model, which is the birth rate per 1,000 and the vaccine coverage. And depending on where you are in this band, the estimated confidence in the reduction of um, you know, uh, congenital rubella cases uh, can be very low if you're in the situation where coverage is low and birth rate is high to very high when the birth rate is relatively low and the coverage is very high. So depending on where the country is, you may or may not recommend a particular vaccination strategy. Uh, so that, that would be a successful case. Now, um, here is, uh, uh, so question is, there is sort of worship of mathematical models nowadays. As a math major, I can tell you they're far from perfect. Uh, indeed, uh, my, uh, you know, in, in my past life, uh, I actually have a PhD in applied math. I don't do applied math anymore, but I did, you know, dynamical systems, uh, you know, more semi-professionally in, 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 in 20 years ago. Uh, so I completely agree. Mathematical models are only as good as the assumptions in the data. So you need to understand what they give you and what they don't give you. Um, and typically, whenever humans are involved, uh, most of the assumptions that you make are not going to be correct because people do all kinds of things that you don't uh, expect. So uh, this is um, uh, the classical um, uh, uh, compartment uh, model of disease dynamics. It's called the SIR model. I'll define everything later. So I'm just going to throw it up here. It's a system of uh, what's called nonlinear differential equations. If you've never seen this before, don't worry about it. It's just, this is what the model is. You solve these equations. So S is susceptible, I is infectious, and R is recovered. But, you know, forget about the equations that are there just to say that they are, um, you know, we have a, a system that describes the behavior. So your population is partitioned. Your population is N individuals. It's partitioned into three bins, people that um, are able to become infected but haven't been infected, which is here, in this graph starts at 500. So at the beginning of the epidemic, everybody's susceptible. Uh, infected are those that are, um, or sorry, infectious are those people that have the disease and are able to transmit. And recovered are people that have had the infection and you know, have either um, recovered or died or have been removed from the population. And here's the population dynamic in a very simple model. And you can kind of see, uh, also you can think of this as a, you know, as, as a, as a predator prey kind of situation. Uh, when in the beginning you have uh, everybody susceptible, then over time, this fraction drops and eventually becomes zero if you run long enough. And this is because you have more and more people become infection, infected. There's a peak at which point the maximum number of infections is reached. And then at a point it starts dropping down simply because you've run out of susceptible hosts. You only have 500. So once you've infected 500, you have nowhere else to go. And the blue line is the recovered case, right? So, you know, the beginning, nobody's recovered because nobody had the infection. And then as it goes through time, you basically have a complete uh, removal of uh, uh, infected individuals, oh, sorry, susceptible individuals into the recovered bit. Uh, so you, you, can, you, can, you can do these, you, you can obtain these curves, um, you know, either by solving these equations, and these are simple enough that you can actually get a formula that'll tell you, uh, you know, what to plug in and plot these curves. Or you can, you can do computer simulations or you can, um, you know, solve them using a software package. Uh, so here, um, this is a great, um, uh, and, and I highly encourage you to, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doing a lot of switching between uh, apps today. Uh, but there's this really cool um, 
uh, simulation, or thought I thought, uh, which kind of uh, illustrates um, a lot of the disease dynamics in one place. Um, so this was, you know, published at the beginning of the epidemic by a guy that does data visualization. Uh, so, um, and it's a dynamical system in the sense that, um, so, you know, it's running a simulation, but let me explain what it's actually showing you. Uh, so you have um, dots, which are um, individuals, black dots are susceptible, red dots that are sick, right? And then you have everybody that's grayed out is um, uh, resolved. Right, and result in this case means either um, you know recovered or dead, uh, and lines indicate who infected whom. Um, and you can see this basically we're running through time, and this shows you a time slice, basically a different way to view the same graph. As you run through the epidemic, you know more and more people um, uh, become infected and then recover, and you have a small number of individuals that might never get sick just because by chance they never uh, you know, got into contact with an infected individual. Uh, but if you run it long enough, uh, so there, there's, there's one time course, it's pretty slow. Uh, and, and here are the sliding bars that control um, the um, epidemic uh, rate. So we're just gonna look at this one. So we'll look at R0 and I'll define what it is. But at this point, R0 basically means, um, as I'll, tell you later, it, it's sort of the, one of the most abused uh, terms in epidemiology, uh, is perhaps the, uh, the, the, the most intuitive uh, understanding. It's that the number of secondary cases per infected individual. So an R0 of one means that if you have COVID, on average, you'll infect one other person. Uh, now let's make it worse. So uh, let's make it like super worse. So on average, you infect four uh, per case. So notice what happens now. Uh, to this epidemic, right? So each time, so notice the number of sick goes very, very rapidly, right? Everybody's infected and then eventually people start recovering. But notice how much faster the spread occurred, right? So this is sort of extreme. One is just basic maintenance. If you, if you drive R0 to uh, less than one, then, you know, just in terms of, uh, it, it's basically below uh, sustainability. So if you on average only infect half another individual, uh, then the number of cases over time is expected to drop. So we'll see what happens here. All right, so now you see that, that this, you know, if, 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 if the pathogen is not terribly good at transmission, then with doing nothing, you know, you're going to have some proportion of the population infected, but a large fraction of the population will never be infected simply because they never come in contact with an infectious individual. And if you drive it down to an even smaller number, like 0.1, it might be broken. I think it's actually doing absolutely nothing yet. It's very slowly growing. There we go, now it's becoming, it's resolving very quickly because infectiousness became. So there you go. Now, now basically very few people become infected. Uh, so, you know, just play around with this um, uh, visualization. I think it's a great uh, uh, illustration to sort of show you uh, very visually how um, a disease spread is controlled by um, various um, key epidemic parameters. Uh, let me switch back over to Zoom and start sharing the screen again. There was a question. All right, so um, there are different flavors uh, of the um, uh, SIR model. So, uh, you know, the other two flavors that you might come across is uh, SIS or susceptible and infectious. So you're either susceptible or infectious and you can move between bins. So this is usually meant to uh, uh, represent the cases where there's no lasting immunity. Uh, uh, and you know seasonal um, influenza can be modeled this way or common cold or you have a, a, a four compartment model called the SEER model where in susceptible goes to exposed goes to infectious goes to recovered 
what this is meant to do, this is meant to add a state where you are infected but not yet infectious. So you're, you're at an incubation period. Uh, I already did this. So what may be some of the limitations of these types of models? Um, these, um, uh, uh, these models are basically uh, not really used uh, for uh, you know, serious disease prediction because they're too simple. Um, and um, the biggest issue with them is that they assume they're basically a physics type model, which are good for particles or things that are exactly the same, but they treat old people as exactly the same. So we have the same contacts, we have the same susceptibility, uh, you know, anybody is completely exchangeable, which is obviously very, very not true for people. We have different immune systems, we have different contact patterns, we live in different places, you know, we see different people, you know, some are more social, some are less social, you know, uh, some have, um, you know, some are older, some are younger. So all of this has to be incorporated. But fundamentally, these types of models can be extended to sort of add more and more realism at the addition of, uh, you know, sort of more complexity. And they're kind of a useful idealized system to understand what epidemics do. So it's just sort of moving sliders around gives you a sense of the course outcome of the epidemic. Uh, so some key terminology uh, uh, for epidemic parameters. Um, as you might have seen all of this, I just wanted to define it. Uh, so there's something called prevalence, uh, which is defined as a proportion or the number of individuals infected at a given time or all infections per unit time. Uh, incidence is almost the same, except it's newly infected. All right, so for, for diseases that are very quickly resolved, there's not gonna be a whole lot of difference between prevalence and incidence. And basically prevalence counts, you know, um, if you're doing say weekly prevalence, it's all the people that got infected this week, plus all the people that were infected last week and are still sick, plus all the people that are infected two weeks ago and are still sick. Uh, so they, uh, that would be very different for chronic diseases like HIV, which basically once you're infected, you're always infected. So prevalence always goes up until there's a cure and incidence changes over time. And then more relevant for uh, studying uh, or interpreting data, uh, uh, you know, that, that you're likely to see. And a lot of times, unfortunately, these two get conflated um, or they used to get conflated in, in the press. Uh, it, it measures um, sort of the uh, uh, severity of the disease. Uh, so you, you, and you have two quantities, you have CFR, called case, case fatality rate, which is the fraction of all confirmed cases that lead to death, and IFR, which is infection fatality rate, the fraction of all cases, symptomatic or not, that lead to death. Uh, so, you know, by these definitions, you know, which one do you think is bigger? Do you think CFR is bigger or IFR is bigger? Ah, interesting. CFR, yay, there we go. So what changes, right? It's, uh, so the, the denominator is always, the numerator is always the same. It's the number of deaths. What changes is the denominator. The denominator is all symptomatic or confirmed cases versus all the cases that are symptomatic or not. So infections rate basically count, in the denominator you put everybody that had COVID, whether or not you know it or not, whether or not they had symptoms or not, so the denominator is bigger in the IFR, and this is what you want. Yeah, so asymptomatic, exactly. Asymptomatic plus confirmed is greater than confirmed. So IFR is never greater than CFR. And it's, a, it's very important for prevention because early on we only had CFR. And CFR, if you look back at the epidemic, and if I don't have the slide for this, but you can look it up, maybe I'll introduce it later, is that one thing that happened to our estimates of how uh, 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 dangerous in terms of you know fatality rate of COVID was it pretty much always you know it started out at you know maybe one to two percent in March and the consensus estimate now that it's about you know at least five times less uh, uh, dangerous so um, we, we basically got better at, uh, at estimating the denominator and this is very important the same thing for prevalence and incidence so prevalence is always higher than incidence because it counts incidence plus other cases and uh, we have um, you know, some key terminology, I'm sure you've seen or not. Um, it's called basic reproduction number or basic reproductive number. Um, uh, not R0, R0. Uh, 
average number of infections caused by a typical infected individual in a population consistent only of susceptibles. Uh, if R0 is greater than one, the infectious agent can start to spread. If it's less than one, it's gonna die out. Uh, our best estimate for SARS and for MERS, for sure R0 was less than one, so it died out on its own. It was just not very good at transmission. Uh, effective reproduction number RE is the average number of infectious causes by a typical infected uh, individual when only part of the population is susceptible. Uh, in most cases, you will see these two uh, used interchangeably. Depending on the model, it could be different. If RE is greater than one, infectious agent can continue to spread. So you basically, you know, think of one as sustainable, right? So you have, uh, you know, one uh, infected individual gives disease to another, uh, but only one, so it cannot grow on average. But if it's greater than one, it will grow and it will grow exponentially, um, up subject to some bounds. Uh, force of infection is defined as per capita rate at which susceptible individuals acquire infection. Uh, critical community size, the minimum number of individuals in the population that uh, allow an infectious agent to persist without importation of cases. Uh, the important thing to realize is whenever you see these things reported, they're not measured they are estimated, so they're idealized. Just like when you're talking about an average American or an average worker or an average voter, the average voter doesn't exist. There are people, right, especially now, I mean, this is a great example. You don't really have, you, you have very few people in the middle. You have two extremes uh, and you know the average would be nobody, right? Because I don't even know who that person is. Um, and uh, the same thing, you know, when you talk about average, it's an idealization, right? So obviously in a real infection, it's not true that if R0 is two, then every person with COVID is gonna exact, infect exactly two people. There's gonna be some variation, but it's an average of a distribution. And they are uh, measured, uh, they're not measured, they're estimated. Uh, and here's a, um, uh, a nice um, cartoon, sorry. Susceptible includes asymptomatic and symptomatic or people who are just more at risk of more. Susceptible means not infected, but could be infected. Uh, the question is, why do we rely on this estimated data? Oh, because you can't measure it. I mean, it's like some measurements are good, right? You know, you, if a physicist tell you that, you know, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, you're not going to question it because it's been measured and confirmed. Uh, Right, uh, uh, you know, maybe not directly uh, at first, but you, you, you could be indirectly estimated. So there's some estimates that are better than others, right? And a lot of the things, for instance, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, sense, you know, like the census, for instance, we don't count every single person, uh, or at least not everywhere. We, we count, you know, a substantial fraction, and we make an inference that is so statistically precise that it's, you know, uh, indistinguishable from what we would have gotten if we counted everybody. So some estimates are good, but it is important to understand that estimates are only as, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 they're, they're not necessarily perfect. So you need to understand the issues that come with them. So here are sort of, uh, you know, great Wikipedia cartoons. I'm, I'm sure this has all been updated because of COVID. And you go back in the history and see, you know, what these pages looked like before anybody cared. Uh, so here are um, sort of some general strategies of what can happen to the epidemic. Right, so you have, um, and, and this sort of goes to the concept of super spreading and uh, not really super spreading, but herd immunity, which has also been uh, 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 unfortunately politicized. There's, in the scientific term, there's nothing political about it. It's just a definition, and we'll give it to you. Uh, so um, you have uh, started with a population that's not immunized but still healthy. You have a couple of uh, uh, individuals that are sick and start spreading. Uh, if you don't do anything, the contagious disease is gonna spread through the population until it reaches its, you know, however many people was gonna infect. Uh, you can have uh, partially efficacious interventions, which we're kind of, at the moment, that's what we're trying to do. You can think of this as, you know, wearing masks or doing social distancing or limiting contact or limiting travel. Uh, we're basically slowing the spread of infection through some of the population, right? If you don't leave your house, you know, you're not gonna get infected, for example. Uh, and this is the, the goal of um, immunization, where you, in, you don't immunize everyone or protect everyone, but you protect enough people that the disease is unable to spread, simply because by chance infected individuals do not come in contact with susceptible individuals. Uh, so the key terminology in terms of prevention, uh, or you know, if we want to look at elimination or control parameters, uh, so herd immunity is simply defined 
as the state of the population where fraction, the fraction protected is just sufficient to prevent outbreaks. Uh, so that basically means that there are enough people that are no longer susceptible that you drop the effective uh, reproductive number to below one. It doesn't mean you eliminate the disease completely. It just means it cannot grow. It will, you know, if left on its own with sufficient level of, um, if you remove enough susceptible individuals from the population, they become, uh, um, the, the, the disease is not spread. Uh, close related to it is something called the critical elimination threshold or PC, which is a proportion of the susceptible population that needs to be successfully protected to achieve herd immunity. And successfully protected is where I think most of the debate is because Traditionally, successfully protected would mean vaccinated. Uh, but this could also mean uh, you know, uh, people that were infected and recovered. Uh, but you know, for, from the standpoint of public health, this is protection means you know, vaccination. Uh, and final size is a fraction of the initial susceptible uh, population that eventually becomes infected during an outbreak. The question is susceptible include symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Uh, you know, susceptible just means that anybody that can be infected, uh, right, regardless of whether or not they are, um, I think I already answered this question. Sorry, I'm confused. Uh, so here's, um, you know, a little bit of algebra to show you what, um, what the key, um, uh, this uh, population, um, you know, critical population size is, elimination threshold. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to have uh, the fraction, so R0 is the critical a parameter here is how many new infections you get on average per case. Uh, we'll want to uh, determine the fraction of the population that must remain susceptible uh, in order for R0 times the fraction of the susceptible population to be one, right? So this basically, because not everybody is susceptible, the effective reproductive number is now R0 times the susceptible fraction. The other way to look at it, susceptible fraction is one minus the protected fraction. Right, and now you just solve for PC, right? So, you know, divide by R0, carry over one, and the critical fraction now is one minus one divided by R0. Uh, now you can start seeing why R0 is such an important parameter, because, you know, if you believe it, it accurately describes the average behavior of the epidemic, it influences a very, very important parameter, which is what proportion of the population must be protected in order to stop the spread of the disease. Um, and here's, here's some examples. Obviously, in, intuitively, if you have a bigger R0, you need to protect a larger fraction of the population just because the disease is more transmissible. And here's some examples for you. You know, if R effective or R0, which I'm going to use interchangeably, is just above 1, say 1.1, then the protective fraction is a uh, 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 critical proportion um, is just 9%. If you go to 10, it's now 90%. Uh, and it grows quite rapidly, so here's the curve. So the question is, um, where is R0 for COVID or for SARS-CoV-2? Uh, does anybody happen to know? Have you guys, what's your guess? Where do you think it is? Um, and there's a range. There's not a precise estimate. I'm just curious what your um, impressions are of how infectious uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is. Where do you think it is in this spectrum? Nobody? Ah, 50%. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you're looking at PC, but I mean, R0 is somewhere between two and three, right? Yeah, there we go, two and a half. Yeah, so that's, I mean, if I were to pick a number, it's somewhere between two and three, the best estimate, even though there's, there's a considerable range. So if you take it at face value, if you say it's between two and three, and let's say it's gonna be pessimistic, it's three, then you need to protect two thirds of the population. Uh, so here's some examples of, uh, you know, what these um, are not um, have been estimated for uh, popular or not popular, but common diseases. Um, there are a lot of different information. So uh, the one, uh, one thing I would like you to notice is that none of them are point estimates. So there's always a range. So R0 is a pretty tricky uh, number to estimate. There are lots of different methods. I'll show you a couple of examples later on. The methods are too complicated to present, really, but you can conceptually understand them. And there's a range of, um, you know, uh, so you know, pertussis 
or whooping cough or measles are very, very infectious. So over 10, and chicken pox is infectious. But then if you go into uh, you know, some of the nastier diseases like Ebola or HIV or tuberculosis, they're you know, much uh, smaller uh, uh, base of rate productive numbers. Um, and you know, here's um, uh, an example uh, of you know, a successful, so measles is a classic, classic example of a very successful vaccination. So you had uh, you know, this pretty nasty disease uh, in the United States that prior to the um, introduction of the vaccination kind of had an oscillatory behavior, but in an average year, uh, you would have you know, on the order of half a million to 600,000 people uh, infected. Uh, then you had a successful introduction of the vaccine in 1963, you know, was deployed, and you see there was a dramatic reduction. However, even then, notice how long this period takes. So there's a, a notable drop right away, but it takes a couple of years, you know, for enough of the vaccine. So see, there is the uptake, and then there's a blip, and then there was a, um, uh, uh, you know, higher vaccination levels, and then basically it was beaten down and effectively eliminate it, right? It was declared eliminated. Um, except you have um, this spike uh, in the 2000s. Does anybody know what the spike is from? Um, you know, why do we have a resurgence of measles cases? Yeah, we have anti-vaxxers, that's right. We have people that are paradoxically you know, they're usually not uh, the ones that you would consider to be anti-science, uh, but in this particular case, they are. Uh, they tend to be, you know, uh, they're religious people and they're people that are just, you know, that think that vaccines cause autism and, you know, all kinds of things. But these particular outbreaks are usually, um, they're actually tracked down to um, areas where a lot of people do not vaccinate. So the herd immunity in this case uh, is this idea that because measles just isn't around, uh, you don't need to take a vaccine because enough people out, you know, in the rest of your community to take the vaccine to beat it down. But measles is incredibly infectious, right? So you do not need to have a very high level of um, uh, susceptible individuals in order for this to start picking up and spreading again. Uh, so the vaccine coverage is important, right? So see our 90% vaccine coverage was maintained for about 20 years and was very successfully up, uh, um, you know, maintained. But a couple of things just to notice, even with the introduction of the successful vaccine, it takes a little while for things to result. And this was a very, very successful vaccine. Uh, and you need to maintain a high level of coverage to make sure the disease doesn't come back. So, you know, this has to occur for SARS-CoV-2 as well in order for us to deal, it, deal with it. So even if a successful vaccine is available tomorrow, it is going to take you know, a little bit of time, potentially significant amount of time before it's sufficiently widely distributed, deployed and given uh, to uh, you know, bring uh, uh, the epidemic down. I would imagine, uh, and, and, and anybody can speculate, I have no idea, you know, what would happen if a vaccine became available. Unfortunately, I can predict that there's gonna be a lot of squabbling about its efficacy or ADC. Uh, people on both sides of the political uh, 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 aisle, you know, uh, engage in stupid theater. You know, like, like I think, you know, the fact that there's uh, the belief that the FDA might be pushed to approve a vaccine uh, before it's ready is, is not good. But I also think that the fact that individual states uh, are now, um, you know, setting up camps and saying we're going to do our own review of vaccines um, is um, very unfortunate. Um, it, it basically just, it, the, the last thing we want is we do not want vaccine to become a political thing because once you make a political, once you make it a political thing, it'll become very emotional and people will make irrational decisions. And I find that probably one of the saddest things uh, um, that I've observed. Uh, but let's see where we are. I would really like to be proven wrong. Um, uh, the other, um, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, epidemiology, epidemiology is a very uh, uh, strong, uh, not a very strong, it's a very quantitative, very developed field with a lot of models and a lot of sophistication. So I'm only gonna mention a couple of important uh, uh, sort of factors. Uh, and you might've uh, you know, heard of the idea of super spreader, super shedder. Uh, 
that simply means that an infected individual that produces substantially more new cases than the average for a variety of reasons. They might be more infectious. Um, you know, they, they, they may be infected for longer. Uh, they may come into contact with a lot more people or any combination of these. Um, and even uh, the issue with uh, having these super spreaders is that they can substantially modulate uh, the behavior even for small RE because they can, um, you know, sort of seed local outbreaks. And then the other uh, thing you will often see in models is something called a meta population, where you take individuals and break them down into compartments like by state, uh, a geographic region, or some, depending on the model, you can break them down into different age groups, for example, because you know, that would be important for COVID. And you model this separate, and they can, they, but they can transmit from uh, one another. Oh, the question is, uh, is are not problematic due to as asymptomatic patients and maybe I diagnose? Uh, Estimating R0 is difficult if you have incorrect data, but R0 itself doesn't depend on the patient. R0 is a property of the, of the pathogen, um, mostly, right? If, I mean, if you, if you think of it as an idealized case where, uh, you know, you have an individual that comes into contact with enough susceptibles, how many on average is it going to infect? That mostly depends on the pathogen, uh, at least in this idealized scenario. But you're right, there's a lot of uh, variability in noise. If you don't measure, um, the correct, if you don't correctly measure the number of infected individuals and the rate at which they change, you will have a poor estimate of R0 for sure. Uh, uh, here's an example of, uh, you know, some of the estimates uh, of R0 from Wikipedia. Um, again, not a whole, not, not particularly important to see, uh, you know, what they all are, other than to notice that there's a range in all of them. Uh, one of the interesting things, for instance, here from MERS, it's you know below one. It's estimated uh, to be between 0.3 and 0.8, which means that this disease would die on its own um, because it simply is not sufficiently infectious. Looks like SARS might be in the same category. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, about COVID. The, similarly, there's a lot of uncertainty about things that we've studied a for a long time ago. For instance, you know influenza, um, seasonal strains, you know vary significantly. Um, and then you have, you know, measles and chicken pox and polio and things like this and different routes of transmission. Uh, now, there's a great um, uh, paper that was put out by the CDC in 2019 that has nothing to do with COVID. Uh, but I, I highly recommend you read this paper in its entirety because it's very short and it sort of uh, touches all the points about, uh, you know, uh, the way people uh, use and misuse this number. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, the abstract um, is very short. I'm just going to you know, read it. Uh, the basic reproduction number are not also called the basic reproduction ratio or rate of or rate or the basic reproductive rate is an epidemiologic metric used to describe the contagiousness or transmissibility of infectious agents. Are not is affected by uh, numerous biological, socio-behavioral, and environmental factors that govern pathogen transmission and therefore is usually estimated with various types of complex mathematical models, which make R0 easily misrepresented, misinterpreted, and misapplied. R0 is not a biological constant for a pathogen, a rate over time, or a measure of disease severity, and R0 cannot be modified through vaccination campaigns. This is important, right? Because vaccination doesn't change the pathogen or the host. Um, R0 is rarely measured directly, and modeled R0 values are dependent on model structures and assumptions. Some are not values reported in the scientific literature are likely obsolete. Are not must be estimated, reported, and applied with great caution because the basic metric is far from simple. I think I could not have said it any better. This was a really, really you know, great summary. Um, and it starts with the fact that there's you know, confusion about how it's defined. Um, you know, if you go back to the original literature, which is actually isn't that old, uh, although the original definition of are not is over 100 years old. So it could be defined as the number of secondary cases one case would produce in a completely susceptible population. Or it could be the um, average number of secondary cases or the expected number of secondary cases. So they're all subtly different, but you know, what expected relative to what? Or you know, average how? Um, so it is a simple number, but it is not straightforward because the simplicity of just one number, and we like a number, Right, just describe everything with one number, you know, scale zero to 10, or you know, a value where high is bad and low is good, or whatever. Uh, 
by reducing a pathogen to a simple number, we're trying to hide its complexity, but we can't. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, uh, issues with, uh, you know, just taking it at face value. And I already said this once, but I'll repeat it, and I'll probably repeat it more than once, is it's usually estimated with complex mathematical models developed using various sets of assumptions. Assumptions are essential. One of the things that, you know, I, I remember from my high school physics teacher that, you know, got me interested in science a long time ago, you know, she always said, start your problem by listing what's given and listing your assumptions, right? And then you can get to the answer. So with a mathematical model, if you're a proper mathematician, you will always say, I assume that this is whole, this is true. All the population, population is homogeneous. All the individuals are the same. I assume this, I assume that. If any of those assumptions is broken, your model may or may not work. If it works, uh, when some of the assumptions are broken, it would be called robust, say in statistics. So it's robust in the sense it doesn't easily break. But if you break enough of the assumptions, everything will break. I mean, imagine trying to build, a, you know, a classic example uh, would be this infamous uh, um, uh, you know, uh, failure, uh, I forget what it was, but I think it was a satellite launch um, where uh, uh, somebody was supposed, you know, one of the measurements was done in Imperial and it was supposed to be done in metric, right? So, you know, things didn't work because a simple assumption was broken. Um, you know, their classic example, it was an airplane that, uh, you know, when Canada switched over from metric to Imperial, there was an airplane that was um, uh, loaded, that was supposed to be loaded in um, pounds, or um, no, it was supposed to be loaded in, in, in metric, but it was loaded in pounds. So it only had half as much fuel as it needed. So it ran out of fuel halfway across Canada because somebody you know, used imperial uh, versus metric. So this is an extreme example, but it's possible. It's possible to misapply the model if you don't um, appreciate the assumptions. Uh, the interpretation of what this model R not tells you may depend on the model. Uh, and people that use R not typically do not have the required training uh, to directly understand what it tells you. Um, you know, there are examples of this paper sites um, in popular press, which include incorrectly defining R not, and for example, misinterpreting the effects of vaccination on R not. R not itself usually depends on three parameters. Um, which are easy to understand, but sometimes difficult to measure. Uh, so it's one of the parameters is, is how long is a person contagious, right? Because the longer you are contagious, the more uh, you're able to infect other people. Uh, the per contact transmission rate, so the likelihood of infection per contact between a susceptible person and infectious person or a vector. Now, this is impossible to measure. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about it because, I mean, try to find out you know, what is your risk of becoming infected with COVID if you do X, right? What's your risk if you, uh, you know, uh, if you pass by somebody, uh, you know, who's infected? Well, you know, how do you measure this? You can estimate it, but you can't measure it. How do you measure um, per contact, um, uh, just different type of contact, for example? It's something that has to be estimated. And the contact rate, which is how often do you see other people, right? So this all makes sense, right? You have per contact probability of transmission, and you have uh, the number of contacts that you can make in a given period of time. Uh, so uh, if you go back to the, you know, one of the early papers that defined R0 uh, uh, by this German gentleman called uh, Dietz, uh, uh, published in 1993, uh, it, it's a mathematical paper, which I don't expect you to read, but it just has a couple of interesting facts. Uh, at first, uh, it was actually defined in demography. It was called the net reproduction rate. Uh, and the original definition of the Sother track down goes to uh, this 1886 calculation by a, uh, you know, what you would call a German public health official, uh, Richard Bach, that wanted to calculate the total propagation of the population, the products of the survival probabilities for all reproductive years between 14 and 53, and the rates of giving birth to a girl. So this is a way to basically estimate population growth. Uh, so, and he concluded that 2.172 female babies would be born to an average woman who throughout her life would be subject to current age-specific mortality and fertility rates. Uh, this is just a mathematical way to say it, uh, that if you want to define R0 in this sense, you multiply the probability the woman lives to be um, eight years old 
and multiplied by the rate of giving birth to a girl uh, at the same age. And then the inner girl is just basically a sum over all ages, right? So this is what he did here. So this is a formal definition of R0, which is more or less what we have in epidemiology. You can reduce R0 in the very simple system to this relationship. It's a product of the number of persons contacted per unit time by one infectious individuals uh, times uh, the fraction um, of these contacts that lead to an infection, and then the rate of removal of infectious individual divided by uh, uh, lambda. So this is a very simple expression of R0. And this is not how it's estimated, but it's, it's sort of just an expression to tell you that it depends on three different things. Uh, and even if the infections of a pathogen uh, and the duration of contagiousness are biological constants, R0 will fluctuate if the rate of human to human or human to vector interactions varies over time and space. Uh, and importantly, there's limited evidence to support that if you inferred R0, say in China, it would be applicable to uh, Pennsylvania, right? Because all kinds of different things are there. People you know, have different contact patterns, we have different population densities, we have different cultural habits, you know, mask wearing, you know, personal space, all that kind of thing. So it could be quite difficult to transfer. Uh, you know, for example, population density, social organization, seasonality will all affect R0. And it is also a function, because R0 is a function of the effective contact rate, it will also depend on the, it'll be a function of social behavior, and well as the biological characteristics of a particular population. Yeah, for instance, measles uh, has been studied quite well, and there was a review in 2017 that looked at the literature and found R0 estimate that have two orders of magnitude difference. So from 3.7, to 103.3. Does it mean that they're all wrong? No, it just means that there is a lot of variability in this R0. And could actually, you could imagine biological scenarios where both of these extremes are true, right? Very dense population with high rates of contact, very sparse populations with low rates of contact, and so on. Um, and R0 is always, almost always estimated retrospectively, which means after the fact, from uh, epidemiological curves or seroprevalence data, and by using theoretical models, um, you know, and they use things like the number of susceptible person, average age of infection, and so on. Uh, as we already mentioned before, when you use a mathematical model, you know, for instance, it'll tell you you have to plug in the transmission uh, probability per contact. Where do you get that number? You don't. You uh, you you get a uh, uh, you sort of come up with a reasonable guess. Uh, the, uh, and that's one of the guesses that goes into generating this R0. A lot of them are not often made public. So population mixing and contact patterns must also be considered for homogeneous mixing or population members are equal like and so on. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, but many of the parameters included in the models are merely educated guesses. And it becomes worse if the model becomes more complex because you have to make more and more guesses. Uh, the other thing that you might not appreciate if you've looked at mathematical models is that a lot of times you make an assumption that they, they exhibit stable behavior in the sense that, you know, say your model needs a parameter, say it needs a per contact parameter, and you give it a value of 0.2, right? You run it, you get an estimate. Your intuition is if you change it to 0.21 or make a small change, the result should not change very much. It could actually not be true at all. Some dynamical systems have... Uh, you know, phase shifts and behaviors where you tweak the parameter just a little bit, all of a sudden the model gives you an entirely different answer. You need to have a sense of how reliable uh, and how stable the output is. And finally, uh, and this is actually true because Wikipedia, I, I found it amusing, Wikipedia reports uh, for measles uh, R0 value of 12 to 18. What it doesn't tell you is that it's based on the data that is nearly 100 years old, 1912 to 1928 in the United States, and 1944 to 1979 in, in England to Wales. Uh, and it's actually not accurate. So the most more recent estimates of R0 uh, highlight a much greater numerical range and variation. So um, here's one last, actually, I'm, I'm going to skip, um, I'm going to come back to this last. Uh, so here's an example, and you can look at this at, at your leisure. Uh, this is a, um, paper that's quite old. It was published uh, in uh, February of 2020. So the, before, you know, 
if you go back to what the news coverage was, COVID wasn't in the news. Uh, you know, we're being told that it's not going to be any better than the seasonal flu and, you know, pay attention to other things. Uh, but even then, you can see that this was in February. This is a review paper that was published in February. One of the first things that people will do when there's a new pathogen that will try to estimate R0. So by then, there was already one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different estimates. You know, they were um, all done in December or January. It's a really nice summary. It gives you uh, a, a view of you know, how this was estimated, uh, you know, mathematical model. Uh, so the big difference is that, uh, you know, stochastic Markov chain Monte Carlo methods means you did it by simulation. So you, you, you did computer simulations of uh, an epidemic and you, you tune the parameters this way. Mathematical mo model is differential equations like what we described, a stochastic exponential model. It's again, simulations, statistical maximum likelihood estimation. So this is a probabilistic model of mathematical transmission and so on. This is how they were estimated. And here's the range, right? So this is very early. And you can see that like, if you take it at face value, uh, it, it's a very, very, noisy estimate so you know you have estimates 2.6 uh, so the question is where was it estimated uh it, it, you see there's a column here that says location so this was wuhan hubei china china so it was all done in china right because by then there was no there actually was sustained transmission we just didn't know about it uh, but look the estimates are quite um uh, wide and interestingly enough they cannot be compatible with one another at face value so you know this says the estimate is 2.7. The confidence interval is 2.5 to 2.8, so it's pretty tight. Uh, and here it's 6.5, and the confidence interval is 3.6 to 6.60. So there's no overlap between them. It could both be true. That could just be different epidemics, uh, but it's probably also you know difference in modeling. So here you are, right? Uh, you know, say in a retrospect, we know how it all turned out, but you go back to um, February, look at these data and you're a policy decision, you're a decision maker. You know, what, what do you make of it? Uh, you know, there's a dramatic difference between a pathogen that has, you know, an R0 of say 1.4 and the one that has an R0 of 6.5. It's not simple. And, you know, it, it, it never is. At some point you have to take a guess. Uh, so the last thing, and, you know, if, if, you want, if you want to read some um, amusing background story, uh, this has nothing to do with, um, uh, uh, this is actually not a peer-reviewed paper, but it was in a developer's journal. It just kind of gives you a different view. Uh, one of the models, the Imperial College model that was used, um, you know, when you, see, when you hear the 2.2 million deaths predicted, it, it actually, you know, the, that number was uh, mentioned multiple times say, in the presidential debates. It came from this model. That, that is the model that gave that number that was used by governments in the UK and the United States to uh, make the decision. Uh, this is a um, uh, uh, paper, uh, and it just, you know, just, just criticism, it's not necessarily fair, but you should, you should take a look at it just to see what, what happened. When scientific software, which is usually not reviewed by professionals, was reviewed by professional developers. Um, so for example, the claim was made by, uh, you know, an ex-Google software developer, unfortunately doesn't go, you know, under the pseudonym. Um, Due to bugs, the code gives different results given different inputs. Uh, even the code that was being evaluated by interested developers doesn't actually paint the full picture and so on. So the code has a replicability issue. So there was a lot of debate about whether or not this code was even correct. Um, and that's sort of a side story. But um, we, we did make decisions based on a piece of academic software that was not in the public domain that was used. Its code was not reviewed until April. And then those conflicting decisions um, or conflicting descriptions about what this code was actually able to do. You know, stop and think about it for a second. This is what actually happened. Um, and it wasn't just us. So, um, all right, I will um, go back to uh, conclude by doing uh, just this one uh, live demo, uh, which gives you a live picture of um, what the epidemic seems to be doing. All right, can you see this guys? RT COVID-19. 
So this is just, um, uh, 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 this is a little um, stochastic model uh, that basically does curve fitting, but it try, it, it meant it, it, it's trying to give you um, uh, a, sort of up-to-date estimates and trends of what they called RT, a key measure of how fast the virus is growing. If the average number of people who become infected by an infectious person, so if RT is above one, the virus will spread quickly. When RT is below one, the virus will stop spreading. And then you can look at, so for instance, you can look at, you know, sort of at a glance, right, where we all are statewide. Um, right, so uh, according to this, Mississippi and Oklahoma are the only two places that uh, have our not below zero. And then you have Vermont, Wyoming, Rhode Island. Let's see PAs right here. So we can click on PA. So the current estimate is you know, 1.2. Uh, uh, this is the number of cases, this is the number of tests, and this is their trend over time. Uh, where, you know, with confidence intervals, right? So we had less and less data, and as we go on, uh, you know, it gets better. So you have, uh, you know, uh, before, uh, initial phase, then the original shelter in place, the reopening shelter ended, and it sort of you know bubbled around in the summer, and now the estimate it's just above one. Um, there's there's more than one site like this, but it's um, it, it sort of this is um, you know the one that's probably easiest to use, um, and you know take it as um, you know with a grain of salt like any other model. So here's um, you know here's a view of state by state. Um, you can sort of stare at it and try to uh, you know tell whatever story you want to tell. Um, you know, compare. So here's New York. Uh, you know, for instance. Um, yeah. You know, so there's New York. Uh, there's New Jersey. You know, they were hit really hard in the beginning. Then they had very severe lockdowns. Um, you know, you can compare it to states that did very little. Uh, you know, like Nebraska that basically had almost nothing. But they're difficult to compare because they're also very different states. So remember that these numbers. You know, combine um, so much information uh, together. Um, all right, um, so let me do one more thing. Um, which is I don't I didn't put the slide at the end um, about your assigned reading. Oh wait, sorry, I forgot to do. Let me do one thing real quick. Um, I forgot um, to get to seasonality because um, we're at ten more minutes. I'll just go through it very quickly. Um, Switch back over to uh, keynote. Skip the next couple of slides. So seasonality um, is um, very simply defined, at least according to this review, and it's not uh, something I would disagree with. It's a periodic surge in disease incidents corresponding to seasons or other calendar periods. Um, Again, this is something that has been known um, for quite some time. So, you know, on account of the principal variations of the weather and the concomitant epidemic diseases from the year 1726 to the end of the year 1734. Um, so, you know, pre-Victorian England uh, was aware of this. Um, and these are, um, so here's a chart, again, a historical chart, temporal trend in mortality um, in the upper section and humidity and temperature in the lower section in New York City in 1887. Uh, the lowermost mortality curve in the upper panel shows wintertime seasonality. So here in pneumonia and influenza deaths. So you can see, so here's winter, uh, you know, January to December. So there's a trough in the summer um, and elevations near the end, uh, beginning in the end of the year. Uh, however, this pattern is less impressive than the summertime surge in old cause mortality in children and adults shown in the same paddle. Um, so old causes over age of five. Um, you know, a more recent seasonality, feel that there's plenty of information. Influenza is a classic seasonal disease where you have, um, you, I, I think we saw it three or four different ways already, uh, or at least in the Northern Hemisphere, you have um, winter patterns you know, with um, annual rate of an infection. So, and this is, this is a paper in China. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, um, to be honest, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, possibilities of what um, explains seasonal behavior. Uh, there's a lot of debate about it. Uh, it is different from a uh, pathogen to pathogen. Uh, so I'll just sort of hit the highlights. 
you know, one could be population behavior. So human themselves, uh, you know, their behavior and activities have seasonal rhythm. Uh, you can have, uh, therefore, increased transmissibility of pathogen because of increased proximity of humans to one another or to increased exposure to pathogen. You know, some of the examples that you might think of is that when all, uh, you know, say college students uh, come to school, right? They all come from different places. They all congregate in one spot. So you change contact patterns and potential transmission opportunities for the pathogen. Uh, when families gather for holidays is another example of just traveling. Uh, however, there's little empirical data uh, to show that this is a strong driver. You can have pathogen to pathogen interactions. So seasonality of some infectious disease is actually driven by the seasonal occurrence of other infectious disease. So for example, if you have influenza that weakens or modifies your host immune response, it makes you more susceptible to infection with other pathogens. It is also difficult to say, you know, what's the cause and what's the effect because you have correlation, but you cannot draw causation. It could just be regular seasonal patterns that are independent of one another. You can have things like environmental effect and pathogens. Uh, so uh, you can have different abundance. Some, some pathogens just might be, you know, more or less transmissible or uh, survivable in, you know, winter versus summer. Uh, uh, for example, you know, for uh, rotavirus and influenza, uh, seasonal changes in humidity have been credited with improving in duration of viral survival. So it increased opportunities for hosts to inhale aerosolized virus or to become inoculated as a result of contact with contaminated surfaces. And then you have temperature and other environmental distresses which influence expression of viral virulence factor and important pathogens or change of transmission routes. Again, you know, some pathogens like it wet, some like it dry. Uh, you know, it depends on, uh, on the pathogen and the route of transmission. And you also have a seasonal behavior of hosts, right? So there's a long, year-long pattern, uh, you know, either as a result of a seasonal change in the host immune function or as a result of direct environmental effect on whole defenses, host defenses. Uh, so, for example, changes in human susceptibility, driven perhaps by seasonal changes in the photo period, which is a fancy word to say, you know, longer, shorter days. Uh, could serve as a key driver for infectious disease seasonality. Uh, this is actually uh, potentially quite relevant for uh, uh, COVID because uh, it, there is some evidence that I didn't present uh, that uh, in certain cases, vitamin D is a, uh, um, has a positive effect on you know, both disease outcome and just rate of infection. Um, again, don't quote me on that because I haven't looked at the primary literature, but I have seen out of the corner of my eye that this was reported. So potentially it's there. And it has been reported that seasonal changes in vitamin D metabolism may be an important driver of wintertime susceptibility to infectious diseases. You can also have things like dry air, changes in temperature, uh, can modify uh, basically how uh, successful your mucosal membranes in the nose and, and upper respiratory tract are at uh, you know, stopping infection. All right, um, that's um, the end of my slide deck. I posted reading on um, uh, da, 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 Canvas. It is um, a, a short piece on uh, seasonality of COVID. Uh, at the moment, I do not.